Hi everybody, this is uh, David, and uh, today we're talking about how to interpret a New Testament letter. I think a good place to start before you get into how to do anything is getting a really good idea of what the ultimate goal of what it is you're trying to accomplish. So in this case, we're asking ourselves a question, what is it that I need to know before I can say I understand that letter? Now, I'm going to suggest that there are three goals that you need to um, strive for when interpreting a letter. And it's not until you understand these three things that you really know what a letter is saying. The first goal is to understand the goal of the author. So when Paul sits down, or Peter, or John, when they sit down to write a letter, you got to know what they were ultimately trying to achieve. If they were trying to explain something to somebody, then you got to know what it is they're trying to explain. If they're trying to convince somebody of something, then you got to know that. If they're if they're responding to a question, then you got to know what the what the ultimate answer or the, the answer to the question is. Uh, it's so the first goal is understanding what the author is trying to do when when they're writing that letter. Let me give you an example um, with Philemon. What Paul is trying to do when he writes to Philemon is he's trying to convince Philemon to let Onesimus, Philemon's slave Onesimus, go free so that he can go and serve Paul in the ministry. That's the goal of Paul when he wrote Philemon. And I think that's the understanding that is our first goal. Now, the second thing we need to strive for when we're interpreting a letter is to understand the content of the letter. So if the, if the first goal is to know what the author is trying to do, the next one is what is he saying to accomplish that? So um, as an example, let's take a look at Romans. In the, in the first eight chapters, Paul is trying to explain the gospel. He's, he's just trying to describe the gospel and explain it to the Romans. That's the goal. Now, what's the content? Well, Paul starts off in the first three chapters saying, all people are guilty. The Gentiles are guilty, the Jews are guilty, all are guilty. That's the content in the first three chapters. Then Paul goes on in the ha second half of chapter 3 to the end of chapter 4 to say, you know what, justification is by faith, it's not by law. And all of chapter 4 is dedicated to prove out of the Old Testament that justification has always been by faith and not by observing the law. Then you've got chapters 5 through 8, where Paul says, okay, now that we're justified by faith, this is what God does for us. We have peace with God now. Now we can rejoice in our tribulations because God is using the bad things that happens to us to make us more like His Son, Jesus Christ. And also, one day we will share in the hope of the glory of God. So you've got all these blessings that God is pouring down with us. And then right in the middle of, of chapters 5 and 8, he says, now, even though we're totally forgiven, he spends two chapters to say that doesn't mean we should go on living a, a sinful lifestyle. Uh, we're, our old self is dead, so we should live uh, the way God intended us to live, and that is in righteousness. Anyway, what I've just done is I've described the content of the first eight chapters of Romans. So the goal was, the goal of Paul in that section was to describe the. Uh, describe the gospel and then I just went through the content of it now here's the third goal and I'm gonna go ahead and just let you know up front this is probably the hardest concept for students to understand especially if, if you're new to biblical interpretation so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define what I mean by flow of thought and then we're gonna take some time to look at a, an example out of 1st Corinthians to kinda illustrate what I mean by flow of thought so what is it mean when I say that the third goal is to understand the flow of thought? Well, a, def a definition I've come up with is the relationships of various parts of the message. So the question is, how do these individual parts make the point? So if Paul is trying to prove something and he gives five arguments for it, you got to understand how each individual argument makes the point that he's actually trying to make. Now, uh, I know that might be kind of confusing, so I'm going to give you an example out of um, 
out of First Corinthians. Let's see where I put my Bible here. Let's see, NLT. Here we go. So uh, let's talk about this example from First Corinthians. Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but the first four chapters of Corinthians is dedicated to Paul proving, or he's trying to get the Corinthians to stop being so divided amongst themselves. Let me describe what's happening. Now, Paul lets us know that what the Corinthians were doing, uh, the Corinthian church, was splitting up into different fractions or different sects within the uh, Corinthian church. And some were saying something like, hey, I follow Paul. Others were following uh, this church leader named Apollos. Others were saying, hey, we're followers of Peter. And finally, you had your you know, your super spiritual group were saying, well, you guys follow those guys, but we follow Jesus. And the church was divided each other. And there was, there was, you know, maybe arguments occurring or just divisions within the church because of these fractions. Now, Paul, you know, he spends seven verses telling them uh, that this is what they're doing, but he doesn't go on to argue against it. In fact, if you know, if you were to sit down and read it, it almost seems like Paul completely switches topics now to talk about the wisdom of God. What's interesting is he carries this all the way to chapter three, where finally he gets back on track to talk about the division that's occurring within the church. So let's say we're trying to meet the three goals of interpretation here. Well, I've told you what the first thing is, which is uh, what is the goal of the author? Well, in the first four chapters, he's trying to convince the uh, Corinthian church not to divide themselves based on who their favorite Christian leader is. Then, what's the content? Well, in chapter 4, verse uh, 10 through 17, he describes the problem. Then he spends about a chapter and a half talking about the wisdom of God and the Spirit of God. And it's not till chapter 3 that he starts discussing again um, the, uh, the problem of division. And in chapter 4, um, why they shouldn't be divided that way. Now, the last goal is to understand the flow of thought. Now, what we mean by this here especially is if the first four chapters is he's trying to prove, he's trying to convince them not to be divisive, why does Paul spend a chapter and a half talking about the wisdom of God? What does that have to do with his ultimate goal of convincing the Corinthians not to be divided? Once you understand that, I think you've accomplished the three goals of interpretation. Now, let me just to kind of conclude the uh, illustration here. The reason Paul breaks off and talks about the wisdom of God for a chapter and a half before he gets to the actual division is because the Corinthians saw themselves as maybe to a point of arrogance as very wise and so the reason Paul stops discussing divisions and goes into wisdom is because he he by describing what true wisdom really is when he deals with why they shouldn't be divisive he shows them if you were really wise, you wouldn't be doing this. And so he's describing wisdom to kind of show them how they actually are lacking wisdom and how they're proving their foolishness when they divide themselves among these, among these leaders. Um, and so that's how he uses this wisdom tangent to make his point. So anyway, I hope that explains flow of thought. Um, again, to reiterate, flow of thought is how do the individual parts of an argument, how do they relate to the overall argument itself? And I think uh, 1 Corinthians is a good example of, of why that's important. So these are three goals. Number one, what is the author trying to do? Number two, uh, what does the author say to accomplish that goal? And finally, how do the individual portions of that argument add up to create the overall argument that those are the three goals